back to another episode of Bare Bones Physiology, a podcast where we discuss exercise at large in diseased, aged, and healthy populations through recent published scientific literature. My name is Andrew, and next to me is Muhammad. And today, Muhammad will lead our discussion centered around heart failure. Before I pass it along, I want to mention that whatever is discussed on this podcast is in no way associated with our current academic institution. The thoughts, opinions, and interpretations of today are solely our own. So with that, I'll now pass it along to Mohammed so he can get us started. Mohammed, take it away. Absolutely. Thanks, Andrew. So um, today's discussion is actually quite an interesting one. Um, I remember, you know, I, I I was thinking of that idea and I came I came up to Andrew and I was like, you know what? Okay, let's let's talk about it. It's got it's gotta be, I think, one that involves a lot of just like different opinions. Um, I think it is one that's very relevant to some of the topics that are discussed today, especially within the context of um, I think some of the most critical illnesses that face a huge portion of our population. But I think it is very, very exciting nonetheless and interesting to talk about. So I think um that I, I will get first started by saying what the topic is, which is we're gonna be talking about congestive heart failure and exercise. So we're going to be talking about um, exercise here as perhaps a potential medicine. We're going to also be talking about it as a diagnostic tool as we're going to be covering later on. But when it comes to what congestive heart failure is, I would like to break that term into two parts. So I'll talk a little bit about what heart failure is as a concept, and then I'll cover what the congestive part of it is. So heart failure is because we're bare bare bones physiology, I'll be giving a very straight to the point definition here, which is just simply that the heart is not pumping enough blood to the rest of the body. That's as simple as it goes, right? But when we're now starting to think, well, what are the consequences of the fact that the heart is not pumping enough blood to the body? Well, one of the things that happens is that the heart itself, for it to pump blood, it needs to receive blood in the first place. And if the heart itself is failing at its task of pumping blood, then that means that there's blood that's just accumulated or rather, you know, just not being taken away effectively from other organs, especially the lungs, but also from other organs. So in that case, what happens is that because that blood gets accumulated in other organs, including the lungs and especially the lungs, there's something called, there's just fluid buildup that happens. So basically, you know, the plasma itself starts leaking out of the capillaries and there's there's just fluid buildup. That's as simple as it goes. So then we start thinking, well, you know, why are we even talking about heart failure today? What what's you know, what's what's the reason? Why are we even trying to tie it to exercise? Well, I think that really the the importance of it has been highlighted by by highlighted by a recent epidemiological study that looked that spanned a very long time period, right? And at the same time, I think showed us really the magnitude of of you know heart failure as as a disorder existing, and the cost that it has when it comes to healthcare and when it comes to being able to really um, you know have have a financially sustainable system, especially within healthcare and many of the discussions that take place around that. And annually, it is estimated that globally, heart failure globally costs $108 billion, $108 billion US dollars globally. And that, of course, is something that is not just sort of insignificant. It's actually a very significant cost in many nations, and especially the nations that have these sort of pre-existing factors that make the population much more likely to, to, to have a higher rate of heart failure. I think that that's a good segue into the next point, which is specifically on the fact that these pre-existing factors are ones that include sedentarism. Of course, there are other factors such as you know, high rates of smoking, high rates of alcohol consumption, uh, things relating to obesity, things even relating to ethnic backgrounds uh, that are, let's say, more prone to facing heart failure um, as a disease. But at the same time, sedentarism and sort of not engaging in physical activity is one of the primary uh, uh, factors that could lead to a higher likelihood of heart failure occurring in the first place. I think that that's a very significant thing to think about because let's say, for instance, in nations that don't have enough funding to try and promote physical activity uh, amongst the population. Let's say, for example, you know, there are nations that wouldn't have enough um, outdoor spaces where people can go out. 
or perhaps people not having the financial capacity to go and engage in physical activity in a way that's effective. These are all factors that we need to think about. And I think that really our goal today is to make sure that we highlight the importance of physical activity, but also find some of the nuances that exist in the literature when it comes to the types of physical activity and, and, and its use and the use of exercise as a diagnostic tool to be able to more effectively understand um, heart failure and diagnose it early on. And this is actually a very uh, good segue into the first paper um, of this podcast that we're going to be discussing here. So the paper is titled Left Atrial Stiffness Index Independently Predicts Exercise Intolerance and Quality of Life in Older Obese Patients with Heart Failure with Preserved Ejection Fraction. Now, there's a lot to break down here. But the first thing that I will start off by doing is talking about some of the things that go into heart failure and talking about some of the types of heart failure here. So there are two types of heart failure, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, right? So what is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? Well, what happens is that, you know, we okay, the heart itself as an organ, it's divided into two halves. Well, four quarters, but really, if we were to look at it, it would be the, the half that has the atria, so the left and right, and the half that has the ventricles, so the left and right. The left atrium leads into the left atrium leads into the left ventricle. Right. And what happens is that when, for instance, the left atrium receives blood and then it pumps it down to the left ventricle, if let's say the left ventricle, which eventually pumps, which is supposed to pump the blood to the entire body. If the left ventricle is so thickened to the point that it receives such little blood and then it pumps out the same amount of blood just because it's just not even sufficient blood in the first place. So it's just pumping all the blood that it has because it's just not sufficient. So that means that it has preserved ejection fraction. Now you say, well, if it has preserved ejection fraction, isn't that a good thing? Well, the left ventricle is not even receiving enough blood in the first place. So that means that there isn't enough blood coming out of it. So that's still a big issue. Now, we're going to go on to the second type, which is reduced ejection fraction. The thing with reduced ejection fraction is that the, ventri the ventricles, again, the left ventricle, is receiving blood from the left atria, atrium. But the wall itself is very sort of loose, right? You know, one of the things that we know about the heart is that the left ventricle, left ventricular wall, is actually thicker than the right ventricular wall. And that's for a very good reason, because it pumps blood to the entire body. But really what happens with reduced ejection fraction is that there's an enlargement of the ventricle, and that enlargement does not come along with an enlargement in the wall itself. It almost turns into, let's say, for example, you blow into a balloon, right? And then you deflate that balloon. The wall itself of the balloon, you start noticing that it gets a little bit flimsy. That's exactly what, 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 what happens. Well, not exactly, but in a way, it's kind of a, an analogy there, that the wall itself is a little bit flimsy because of the fact that it's bigger than it, what's, what it's supposed to be. And then the muscles themselves are just, you know, sort of not correlatively bigger along with that size of the ventricle. Um, and I think a good example would actually be the fact that with athletes, for example, who are very trained, right, there is an enlargement of the ventricle. Yes. But what happens along the way is that the ventricle itself gets thicker to account for this enlargement in the ventricle. So that's actually beneficial in their case. But in the case of reduced ejection fraction, that enlargement does not come along with a thickening in the ventricular wall. So moving on from that tangent, um, the fact that there's reduced ejection fraction is mainly because the ventricle itself is not contracting as much, or let's say it's not, it does not have the level of strain that would allow it to contract as much. And therefore, it's not sending enough blood to the rest of the body. But the reduced ejection fraction comes from the fact that the blood that it receives, it does not pump most of the blood that it receives. There's still blood that's accumulated there. And then it returns back. And of course, it's a whole issue. Now, I don't want you to get the impression that the ventricle at all time pumps the blood, all, all the blood that it receives. As a matter of fact, the threshold that exists to sort of identify whether someone has reduced ejection fraction or preserved ejection fraction is that the ventricle must be capable of pumping 
at least 60% of the blood that it had received from the atria or atrium. So if it pumps more than 60% of the blood that it received from the atrium, that means that there's preserved ejection fraction. If, if it pumps less than 60%, that, that means that there's reduced ejection fraction. Now, I know that this is a whole lot of information that I'm throwing you all uh, at you all right now, but I want you to bear with me, right? So now moving into the actual meat of the paper. So the paper itself tried to see, well, okay, so the particular population of people with heart failure that they're trying to study here is people that have preserved ejection fraction. So remember again, ones that have an enlarged ventricle, very thick ventricle, that's so thick to the point that it's just not in, not receiving enough blood. So the study goal was to try and find, well, what level of exercise intolerance do they have when it comes to their maximal oxygen uptake? Uh, of course, they did a VO2 max test, which is the classic sort of gold standard when it comes to trying to study that concept. And then they also tried to do a subjective analysis uh, by by having uh, participants fill out a questionnaire to try and understand their quality of life. And then they also tried to study their left atrium stiffness. And that happened through a Doppler ultrasound. So basically, uh, by, by studying, by understanding how stiff their left atrium is, that means that they'd be able to understand that interaction between the atrium and the ventricle uh, through the cardiac cycle. But... One of the interesting points that that paper brought up is the fact that left atrium stiffness is actually something that not only occurs, more generally speaking, with people with heart failure, but it also occurs in other uh, disease populations. So for example, people with obesity, okay, they have a higher likelihood and higher propensity for left atrium stiffness. Aged populations, they have higher rates of left atrium stiffness. So on its own, left atrium stiffness, independent of heart failure, is a contributor to all-cause mortality. So what they tried to do is that they tried to understand that correlation between left atrium stiffness and quality of life and VO2 max uh, in that case, to try and understand more about that exercise intolerance that happened. And the way that they did it, so to try and understand the left atrium stiffness, they actually looked at the atrium at three phases of its activity, right? So the, the, the cool thing about the atrium is that it goes through three phases during th throughout its activity. So, you know, I'm not sure, of course, who might be familiar with this, but there's something called the ECG. We're all familiar with it, right? So we're all familiar with the electrical activity of the heart and that electrical activity and the fact that it sort of aligns with the cardiac cycle and how the heart works. So the left atrium goes through three fa phases the reservoir phase. So reservoir is basically anything that stores something and keeps it within it. So the left atrium acts as a reservoir during a part of the cardiac cycle, because what happens is that it collects blood from the pulmonary veins and holds it for a period of time. But then after that, it goes through a phase where it's a conduit, meaning that it sort of acts as a passageway of blood into the left ventricle. And that's of course what we all understand about the you know the left ventricle or the left atrium sort of acting as that passageway for blood to get into the left ventricle. But then the cool thing is that when it's in the conduit phase, it's not actually actively contracting or it's just starting to actively contract. That's mainly because of that pressure difference and the the, 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 the bicuspid valve opening up and letting blood through it. But then it acts as a booster of blood in that third phase so that, that it pumps blood right into the left ventricle. And that's when the left atrium actually contracts along, of course, with the right atrium at the same time. But of course, here we're focusing on the left atrium into the left ventricle. So what they did was that they focused on the reservoir and conduit phase. And that, of course, as the authors suggested, has been the way for us to identify uh, sort of, you know, left atrium stiffness. That is one of the ways to identify that. So basically the main conclusion is that patients with heart failure, with preserved ejection fraction, they have a sort of uh, dysregulation of the reservoir and conduit phases. So they're actually not happening to the same degree anymore, right? So the left atrium is not as effective when it comes to, you know, when it comes to being a reservoir and not as effective when it comes to being a conduit, right? 
And this is something that they found on its own independently relates to VO2 max and quality of life, right? And one of the things as well that they're saying, again, as I mentioned, is that that also happens independently of heart failure. Of course, it could be causative as a result of heart failure, but it also happens in other conditions. So therefore, if we are able to target left atrial stiffness on its own, then that could potentially allow us to improve the quality of life of patients with heart failure without trying to directly target the left ventricle. Because remember, again, heart failure mainly happens because of the left ventricle. But left atrial stiffness is something that happens on its own, could be as a result of heart failure, but it could also be as a result of other factors. So it could potentially be able to improve the quality of life of patients by treating left atrial stiffness as a factor on its own. And that's mainly what the what, what the authors of this study tried to, you know, tried to do. Yeah, that's a very interesting paper. Um, very detailed for sure. And then when you go back to the background and, and, and sort of providing that the bare bones sort of uh, understanding of everything, I think it speaks to the complexity of the condition that heart failure is. There's so many factors that go into it. And, and like this paper sort of highlighted, like we're just looking at one particular chamber of the heart. Well, maybe there's something else that we can look at too. So no, that was a really interesting paper for sure. For sure, um, yeah. So yeah, thank you for that. Uh, so moving on to my paper now, um, a little less with regard to the anatomy of the heart and more to do with maybe uh, the physical functioning and quality of life and all that sort of stuff in older patients. So uh, the paper that I'm going to be looking at is called um, Physical Activity and Relationship to Physical Function, Quality of Life, and Cognitive Function in Older Patients with Acute Decompensated Heart Failure. And this paper was actually quite interesting for me. And as we go along, I'll sort of explain and, and hopefully you guys find it interesting too along the way, but uh, sort of the background information with regard to physical activity and something that you touched on as well. Uh, low levels of physical activity is a major risk factor, right? So it's a major, uh, major risk factor for uh, cardiovascular disease, morbidity, mortality, uh, including heart failure. Um, so adults living with chronic stable heart failure have been said to have reduced physical activity levels accompanied by exercise intolerance and reduced quality of life. So that is, those are patients that have been uh, diagnosed with heart failure and have some sort of stable uh, mechanism or, or method in which they can sort of manage heart failure. Well, this paper wanted to compare that, that condition of chronic stable heart failure um, to sort of the acute uh, decompensated heart failure. And essentially what that is, is you get diagnosed very rapidly and the symptoms occur very quickly. Um, so some of those symptoms of, of performance outcomes, um, cardiac output quality, like all of that sort of really decrease rapidly as opposed to like a, a steady decline. It's, it's sort of like a, a downfall. So um, yeah. So when comparing the two within their background information, um, Prior studies have looked at acute decompensated heart failure, and they've shown sort of worse self-assessment outcomes than the ones with the stable chronic heart failure. However, again, a lot of those were self-reported measures. So when anything is self-reported, you often see overestimation of symptoms because you're just basing it off memory or patients are basing it off memory. So there's some strength to it. It's good to have but I think there's also something and some importance to look at the actual, like, what is the actual value? What are we actually looking at? So, uh, so yeah, the purpose of this paper was to assess the amount of intensity of physical activity and sedentary time in patients recently hospitalized with acute decompensated heart failure. And they wanted to compare these reports um, from patients with the chronic stable heart failure along with healthy patients as well. So sort of not age match per se, but within that age category um, that don't show signs of heart failure. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, the sort of the significance of this paper was, was they weren't going to be looking at self-reported assessments. So they were going to be using accelerometer um, assess physical activity. So essentially what that is, is whether you have a, a device like a Fitbit or an Apple Watch, 
Um, again, it's an accelerometer that these patients can wear and it quantifies sort of the actual amount and categorize the amount of physical activity and sedentary time that these, uh, these patients sort of go through. So with that, the results of the study were, they actually were quite startling. So patients with acute decompensated heart failure logged an average of roughly 10 minutes or less than 1% of their waking day in the moderate to vigorous physical activity range. So that is less than 1% of their the time that they're awake spent within moderate to vigorous physical activity. That's quite startling to me. Um, when diving a little bit deeper, now certainly we have moderate to vigorous. There's also sort of a zone in there that's light. Uh, so light activity, whether that's just sort of daily activity, whether it's walking up and down the stairs, doing laundry, whatever it is, sort of that light physical activity range. But they really broke it down into the moderate to vigorous and sedentary time. So sedentary time was extremely high in these patients. Participants spent only 9% of their waking day non-sedentary, meaning, you know, roughly eight, 9% was spent in light activity. But when you look at a percentage of, of the entire day, sedentary time being 89%, that is, that's an astonishing number, right? And then when uh, comparing to the chronic stable heart failure, and the healthy age match controls, their physical activity levels were also very low and their sedentary time was also very high, suggesting that there is a major issue with regard to self-prescribed exercise adherence. Because again, they got that data based on prior studies of self-reported self assessments. So even when looking at those numbers, they're overestimations as well, right? So it's again, it, it's pretty startling. When combining the three groups together, greater than 75% of the total participants had little to no moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity throughout their day, which is quite shocking to me. Because um, again, it shows that although we know exercise is beneficial and reducing sedentary time is equally as beneficial, in the populations who are sort of at risk for heart failure and the, the greatest beneficiaries of sort of these, uh, you know, increasing exercise, reducing sedentary time, all these sort of guidelines, it shows that they're not really doing it. And not just patients with heart failure, but also the patients and sort of that age category at risk for some of these diseases that don't actually show any sort of uh, uh, risk of disease or signs of symptoms, but it's sort of, you know, it, it, it sort of raises the question of like, what are we doing wrong, right? So it, it is pretty interesting with this paper. And that's why I did find it interesting because again, they're pulling data from other studies, from prior studies, and then comparing it to what they did, which is uh, accelerometer based. And you're still seeing similar values from self-reported to actual sort of quantified values of activity. So it does raise some, some, some questions and doesn't really answer a lot of questions. So <laughs> yeah, it is, uh, it is pretty interesting. And, and I thought it was a good paper. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and I, and I think that really, you know, within the context, even of the previous paper that we discussed, uh, even, even connecting it to your paper, I think about it, like, I'm like, oh, you know, in a way that makes sense because they have a reduced exercise and uh, uh, an increased exercise intolerance, mm -hmm. but like to see that even when prescribed that, right, to try and perhaps improve their quality of life is just a much less likelihood of adhering to that treatment, which mm -hmm. again, like, as you said, you know, in a way, you know, what are we doing wrong, right? You know, how can, how can we increase that level of adherence so that we can try and perhaps promote healthy outcomes mm -hmm. um, with people that, you know, might have heart failure. Mm -hmm. So yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that this is a great segue into the next um, paper, which looks at exercise in a different light. So we've been, we, I mean, Andrew, Andrew talked about exercise as in that case, a potential medicine, but really exercise could also be a diagnostic tool. And that I think is what this paper does very effectively. So the title of this paper is pulmonary congestion during exercise stress echocardiography in ischemic and heart failure patients. That's a mouthful. Bit of a mouthful. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> a bit of a but um you know mainly just thinking about this title i know that it sounds complicated but really the, you, know, you know there are some gold gold nuggets that could be taken out of it i think uh, when it comes to this 
I will just I, I just I just want to bring all of your attention to something that's very interesting. This paper or this study had four thousand three hundred and ninety two subjects. I just, just want you to think of that, right? They had four thousand three hundred and ninety two subjects, right? Referred for semi supine bike, so that's a certain type of of, of biking devices, in twenty four certified centers in nine different countries. So that study is one that took place in nine different countries with that number of participants. So really, like, I don't think it gets more representative than that when it comes to the results of the study, right? Um, in, ter in terms of, of course, you know, this study explored various types of heart, heart, uh, heart conditions. Not, I mean, you know, not all types, but various types. So they, they took chronic coronary symptoms. So that's like just, you know, dysregulation of the heart itself not necessarily heart failure, right? They had a certain portion of that. But also when it comes to heart failure in particular, they actually had both patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And the main goal of this study, considering the fact that they had so many participants, was to try and test out the idea of using exercise stress test. So that's basically having participants or patients rather go, th go, go through an exercise test and at the same exercise stress test and at the same time do an echocardiography. So that's essentially an ultrasound that shows how the heart is functioning. That's an oversimplification of what it does, but it shows how the heart is functioning instead of pumping blood in and out and how that could be used in a way to allow us to study that congestion part that I discussed right at the start there. So congestion being the accumulation of fluids within the pulmonary within the pulmonary tissue. Now you're gonna be asking me, well, the thing about it is that echocardiographs actually study the heart primarily. But remember, the heart is in a place where the lungs are around. So you could indirectly be able to, because of the fact that the ultrasound is going through pulmonary tissue as well, you could indirectly be able to also find out if there is an accumulation of fluids within the lungs. Now, to sort of understand what happened there or, or the way that they're trying to almost identify a method uh, to be able to understand that accumulation of fluids using an uh, echocardiograph is that they, they, they identified something called the B-line. So what is a B-line? Well, imagine this, right? Or that's basically what the papers say. Yeah, you have controls, so that's those are people that are healthy, and then you have people with heart failure as well as other coronary conditions that cause congestion, that cause an accumulation of fluids. When, when for instance, controls and people that have coronary conditions, including heart failure, are at rest and they're doing an echocardiograph, there are no light streaks that are formed on their echocardiographs because a B line is essentially a light streak that starts forming on the echocardiograph itself. But what happens is that because of that accumulation of fluids and because of the activation of the lungs to a higher degree, the controls, when they're doing exercise and they're doing an echocardiograph, there is no B line. There are no light streaks on their echocardiograph. But with people that are doing exercise, and have these coronary conditions, there's all of a sudden a formation of B lines on their echocardiographs. And that is one potential way that they're suggesting that we could actually early on detect the presence of congestion. And as a result, perhaps conclude that there might be a coronary issue in the first place. So that's one of the ways that they're kind of trying to um, sort of, you know, impact change through this finding. And say that, yeah, you know, we could do the diagnosis of coronary conditions in a different way through exercise tests and by trying to implement that into, into practice. And I think that that's really interesting because that allows us to kind of think of it in a different light. And uh, of course, I, I, would, I would like for you to kind of, you know, imagine the applications of it even in other conditions that might relate to coronary, um, coronary conditions in general. So, yeah, very, very cool. Yeah, that's very cool indeed. And not a bad sample size. Oh, not a bad not sample, a bad size, sample at all. size at all. 4,392 <laughs> subjects. That's like fascinating. No, that's uh, that's very cool. Yeah, that's a very cool study. Um, and then I guess moving on to the final study. Um, it is titled Cardiac Output Changes During Exercise in Heart Failure Patients 
with a focus on mid exercise. Um, and that one is quite interesting because prior to this study, assessing cardiac uh, performance measurements uh, mid exercise was relatively unknown um, regarding its sort of clinical uh, significance when classifying and categorizing the severity of heart failure itself. Um, so this study set out to explore whether such assessments mid exercise are useful and clinically useful specifically uh, using non-invasive techniques in order to classify heart failure severity. And this paper was quite interesting because it used a retrospective design. So it went back into their database. Um, that's essentially what ret retrospective means. Um, so they went back into the database uh, with, partic with uh, given particular years. Um, and it was looking back at patients who performed a maximal cardiopulmonary exercise test. So they used two groups for the study where they looked at and collected two groups. So one group of healthy individuals, more as their control, and then one group of patients diagnosed with heart failure. So they determined that peak workload, because again, the focus was mid-exercise. So they determined that peak workload and effort to be about 10 minutes based on the data set. So they can then consider sort of mid-exercise being half of that. So five minutes in, um, which again, that could also be, argued as well. If we're just saying that five minutes is the mid exercise point, it's not physiologically based. And again, it's a time-based measure, but that's, that, that was one of the limitations that they mentioned. So I'll sort of leave that be if people are interested in looking at it more. Um, similar to your study, not as much, but a large sample size was used. So again, a major strength to, to any study really. Um, so for the heart failure patients, they um, use 231 participant data sets and then in comparison for the healthy subjects, uh, they used 265 participant data sets. So again, not quite your study, but um, still uh, pretty large nonetheless. Um, so furthermore, regarding uh, the heart failure patients specifically, they were further categorized based on their performance within the exercise test. So they had two groups. So they had a group one was classified as participants who did not reach 50% of their predicted VO2 so just uh, oxygen uptake, so that peak amount. Um, and that group had 68 patients. And then group two was classified as uh, participants who exceeded 50% of their predicted VO2. And that group was 163 uh, patients. So that cutoff was 50%, group one was below, and then group two was above. So that was sort of the classification within the heart failure patients themselves. So. Diving into the results, the results suggest that cardiac output could be measured during exercise. And this is beneficial because in theory, mid-exercise represents a time period of submaximal exercise. So peak exercise is full out maximal, but leading up to that, there is a ramp up period. And that mid-exercise time point, as the authors may know, sort of might represent that submaximal exercise. And that is the type of exercise that involves similar physiological demands as to what is seen during routine daily living, right? So thus being able to assess cardiac functioning at that time point may provide further information not previously seen to clinicians regarding heart failure severity and potential daily living impairments and limitations. So again, pretty interesting. So furthermore, diving into more of the, the physiological uh, things that they wanted to assess. So obviously VO2 was a big one there. And with regard to the heart failure, certainly it was, it was well below the healthy participants, but so was cardiac output and specifically stroke volume. As you mentioned before, looking at ventricular size and chamber size, uh, stroke volume would be impaired in some of these patients if they have a reduced sort of uh, chamber size. So amount of blood that can actually be filled. So stroke volume was a big difference between obviously heart failure patients and non-healthy but also with regard to the group one and group two, right? So the group one uh, patients, again, just to refresh the memory, was below 50% of the VO2. And the group one patients had significantly lower stroke volume compared to the group two. And the group two, again, were still classified as heart failure patients, right? So again, pretty interesting because they're comparing that VO2 measure to actual stroke volume and subsequently cardiac output. Right. So again, very, very interesting there. And then 
looking at sort of the time in which um, sort of exercise fuel utilization switch from aerobic processes to anaerobic. So very short aerobic uses oxygen, anaerobic doesn't use oxygen, right? So typically daily routine activities submaximally, you would think would be primarily aerobic or you would hope at least. Um, with regard to these heart failure patients, they reach their anaerobic threshold much earlier, especially at that mid-exercise point compared to the healthy individual, suggesting that in theory, they can do less work, you could say, right? So less work over time specifically, because anytime you use an anaerobic process, there's going to be byproducts that build up that slowly sort of diminish the uh, the amount and quality of performance. So, um, so yeah, certainly that that's an important variable to look at as well. So that was another further strength to this comparing VO2 to cardiac output and then looking at anaerobic threshold as well. So the significance of this paper specifically, certainly looking at that mid-exercise time point, but it suggests that the severity of heart failure using performance and physiological variables may be possible, right? So again, we're getting to something that is, uh, as you sort of described in, in, in the opening, right, is we're just looking at one particular thing and that being sort of the left ventricle. Um, and I'm not saying this was, uh, the authors did this as a diagnostic tool, but to maybe further classify the severity of heart failure, I think we're getting closer and closer to more answers and more options for that. So that in itself is pretty cool. Um, and sort of with that, sort of your your paper there, your, your uh, second paper, and then this paper here, it sort of leads into the question that I have to sort of spur the discussion here. Uh, so using exercise as a way to assess severity of heart failure, right? So my paper specifically talked about exercise, especially that mid-exercise time point. And then your sort of maybe talked about the diagnostic uh, potential, right? Um, so yeah, with regard to that, like, do you think exercise could be a way to assess diagnostically or the severity of heart failure in, in some of these patients. So I'll sort of pose that question to you, Mohamed. I think, I think by all means, I think that exercise is, is not only an effective medicine on, on its own, as, as many, many scientists have said in the past and continue to say, exercise is something that is very effective in treating various types of conditions. But I think that as the papers that we discussed made clear, in, in your paper, Andrew, that be the one that you just discussed and, and share the paper that we discussed prior to that, exercise could indeed be used as a diagnostic tool. And I think what's really unique about exercise is that it puts the body in a stress condition. And I think that when you put the body in a stress condition, the fact that the body itself tries to adapt to that stress condition in a way that's variable from the normal adaptations that would regularly happen is what I think really shows us the intricacies. Of, of what occur, of what occurs in the first place, right? So for mm -hmm. example, in the paper that I discussed, right, it is one where we see these sort of, you know, the, okay, the exercise occur, controls not having these B lines form, people with heart failure having B lines form on their, on their echocardiograph. So that again, just shows us the severity of that. Sometimes, yes, like when, when you have people undergo a physically stressful or physically demanding task, such as exercise, that just shows us that the, the body could adapt in a different way when in, when in a disease state, in particular with heart failure, and even I think with other cardiovascular issues that might uh, that might occur, as we have also seen in that paper. So I think that yes, like we need to in many ways I think transform our thinking when it comes to exercise, and really think of it sort of beyond that medicine. I think in a way our healthcare system needs to think of exercise in the first place as medicine, mm -hmm. but yeah. even then, if let's say we are able to. Uh, uh, effectively take that step, we also need to think of it as a diagnostic tool. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree there. I think th maybe there's one complex issue that may arise with it is the types of heart failure, right? Like, yeah. I don't I don't think we can say that everything is the same, right? So yeah. what we might think is one, one good test for a particular type of heart failure, a particular type of condition might not be suitable for a different type, right? So, and they might present similar symptoms as well. So I, I, again, I agree with you completely that I think using exercise and almost like a stress test, but 
when we think exercise, it's a good type of stress. It's a stress nonetheless, but it's a good type of stress. And yeah, I think that's beneficial for sure. Um, so yeah, that, that, I, I agree with you completely with regard to that for sure. For sure. And I, and I think like, you know, I think Andrew is a very interesting point because in a way it's like, yeah, exercise. I mean, you know, we see with that study that looked at the beelines, we, we see, we see that uh, congestion is something that happens across the board for mayor, for many coronary issues. So it mm-hmm. could be almost like, yeah, that person does exercise. Oh, there's uh, okay. There's congestion that occurs. Oh, they might have a coronary issue. Let's look further into that. So it might be even the trigger to try and finding out about these diseases in the first place. And I yeah. think that that actually transfers us onto uh, the next discussion point here, which is um, in, in relation to that paper, especially, you know, that you talk about sort of, um, Okay, that variability when it comes to people with heart failure, for instance, not engaging as much in vigorous exercise or not even engaging at all. I mean, you said something as low as like a minute, right? Yeah. That's, that's that's pretty, re- that's really low. Yeah, right? yeah, so yeah. just comparing that with moderate exercise, of course, being higher, but still ultimately being lower than, you know, than the controls. How can we better promote moderate to vigorous exercise in patients with heart failure? So what are your uh, opinions on that? That's such a, such a difficult question, right? Like, cause there's so many different answers and possible explanations, you know, going back to your intro, you talked about sort of that referencing that, that, that study that spanned decades. And then you mentioned that, you know, maybe the reason why it does arise is specifically, and I wrote this down is, you know, not having enough funding and resources to promote physical activity in general. Um, and, and I think that it's so multifactorial, like this, this condition, because, you know, we see a reduction in quality of life and a reduction in quality of life doesn't really, really matter that the diagnostic criteria for that, because a lot of it is questionnaire based, but a lot of it is going to be sort of emotional health as well and your state of mind. And, and I think if these patients already have a low quality of life and a low sort of state of mind and emotional state of mind. Like, are they really going to exercise? Like, is the motivation going to be there? And I think that's the first problem, right? Because, you know, we can we can pump all the money into, you know, promoting all these programs to to increase physical activity. But if they don't want to do it, they're not going to do it. And I don't know, it, to me, it, it represents a lot. And what further complicates that is my first paper with regard to, you know, they looked at heart failure patients, but then they also matched it to healthy sort of age controlled uh, patients as well, uh, not patients, but participants within the study and their sort of moderate to vigorous and intensity exercise was very low as well, like startlingly low. So it's just like, you know, we see it in the heart failure patients and that's what we're talking about today, but we also see it in the people, the similar aged, and it sort of represents a, a bigger issue really with regard to exercise and just promoting it because, Again, it, it's so important. We talk about exercise and these studies are the majority are exercise based because that's where we can sort of identify like how well your body is sort of how, how well your body is demanded upon and how well you can meet those demands. Um, like my paper talked about VO2. So your the ability to uptake oxygen, but then also cardiac output. So things like stroke volume as well. And yeah, I just think, you know, we, we use these tests in these research papers, but, you know, I think it certainly once these patients leave the, leave a lab setting, I don't think they're, it, it's clearly shows that they're not doing any sort of exercise in and of itself. And, and with regard to these patients specifically, like moderate to vigorous does not mean that you're going max heart rate, because that's not what you want with these patients. Cause that's sure. only further going to complicate things um, and, and increase risk of, of sort of sudden cardiac stuff. But moderate to vigorous is simply going for a fast paced walk, right? And, you know, for some of these studies to just represent just like less than 10 minutes of, of moderate to vigorous a day, it's just like, it's just, it's, it's saddening a bit because it's just like, it's such a low number. And these are the patients and and the populations that need it the most. So it's, yeah, it's, it really is a difficult, difficult question. And I think it comes down to quality of life. And sort of the emotional state of mind and motivation that these that these sort of patients have, right? So, yeah, it, it's a touchy question because there really is no Very answer. Much. If we knew the answer, then 
I think we'd be well on our way to hopefully managing, um, not reversing, but yeah. certainly managing this condition. But yeah, indeed, I think like it's it's very it's very interesting to think about it because I go like, well, someone who works paycheck to paycheck, you know, someone who goes to work and sort of you know is under such stressful conditions, or perhaps has two jobs and is working like something on the side and this and that, and it's like. Well, if you go to them, if the physician goes to them and tells them they're like, hey, you know, take uh, can you take a couple of hours out of your day and go for a <laughs> go for it and do this. Like in, yeah. in, a, in a way, we need to also like try and 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 almost like expand our perspective and at the same time also try and look at all these social issues as being really social determinants of health. In a way, they're they're yeah. all connected. And at the end of the day, that person's motivation to engage with exercise is going to be governed by all these factors, even if they do know that exercise is good for them. And even if they know that it could directly lead to their treatment, but it's really, I think it all comes down to, as, as you said, like people's motivation, people's state of mind. If someone is living such a stressful life with pay to, paycheck to paycheck, mm -hmm. how likely are they going to be to try and actively engage in healthy lifestyles? with all that yeah. stress in mind so it's it's kind of a, it's kind of a tough one because you know when we talk about our particular generation it's quite young and if we were to look at sort of the the physical activity rates i i would suggest that they're quite low for our generation but we could almost sure. chalk that up to the technology movement with regard to increasing sedentary time because increase in technology but with heart failure patients it generally happens with older adults and i'm i don't expect an older adult to be playing video games. And that's the reason why they can't, you know what I mean? So again, I, I personally think it comes down to their emotional state of mind and, and their motivation to actually undergo some of these uh, forms of exercise treatment. Um, although they might know it's beneficial, I just getting them there is, is the biggest problem. But I think once you can get them there, especially if you can create sort of a community environment with some of these, so they're not doing it alone, right so whether it is out in the community and you get you know 10 patients with heart failure and you can sort of like almost create this community that sort of uplifts them so you're almost addressing two birds one stone right you're getting physical activity but you're also increasing sort of the the emotional state and emotional well-being because they're around patients and you know people of similar age going through the same condition um i think that would be great in theory, um, and, and I'm sure it is being done and it, it, it's tried, but I think, you know, we'll see, right? We'll see over the years if, if some of these treatments are beneficial, but um, yeah, at least the research and the work is being done. And hopefully that sheds lights on some of the actual practical um, problems with regard to it. But, you know, fingers crossed it, it does sort of reverse it, right? And And, and not just the heart failure patients, but also the healthy aging population as well, because, you know, they're also at risk if, if they're sort of reversing and going back on some of those healthy behaviors, but, you know, only time sure. will tell really. So we can only help. Right. So. Indeed. Indeed. Well, yeah. um, I really loved our conversation today. Uh, it was such an interesting conversation. Uh, thank you so much, everyone for listening to us and watching us. We absolutely encourage you uh, to check out the papers that we brought up today in the description down below um make sure to check it out make sure to check some of the cool diagrams there and i think it'll also sort of allow you to really explore a little bit of that world of you know heart failure and exercise and understanding that a little bit more um we look forward to the next episode with andrew uh you know keep up with our podcast and uh, thank you so much for listening mm -hmm.